Hi, my name is Dr. Jay Desai and I welcome you all to this new video on X-ray diffraction on my YouTube channel, Explore Materials and Metallurgy with Dr. Jay Desai. These are the topics which I'm covering in this video, X-ray generation, XRD working principle, constructive and destructive interference, XRD setup, information obtained or derived from XRD, my XRD results and analysis, XRD manufacturers and their equipment, and how to select and purchase XRD equipment for research. What is my approach towards the same? So X-rays are generated when high-speed electrons they collide with a metal target. And when this high-speed electron, they collide with a metal target, their kinetic energy is converted into heat energy and X-rays. So in an X-ray tube, we have a tungsten filament, which is a cathode, which is our electron generating source. And we have selected this tungsten filament because this tungsten filament can emit electron easily when bias is provided to it. And we are having a high voltage between cathode and anode and this X-ray tube is in the vacuum. So when we provide a high voltage between cathode and anode, this electron will move rapidly from tungsten filament towards our molybdenum target, which is our anode. And they will strike the molybdenum target and the, X, the kinetic energy of the X-rays will be converted into heat energy and X we have to select a material such that uh, it can stop high speed electrons and it can absorb heat generated and that is why we use refractory metal as a target now what is the working principle behind x-ray diffraction so the working principle is that when x-rays they fall on a sample they interact with atoms and change their direction that is they diffract from the original direction. This causing either constructive or destructive interference. And this constructive or destructive interference, based on it, we can gather information about the sample. So that is the basic working principle behind X-ray diffraction. Now, when we will observe constructive interference and when we will observe destructive interference. So when two X-rays are in phase, that is, their crash and troughs, they occur at the same time. You can see that these are the two waves and their crash and troughs are occurring at the same time. The resultant wave has a higher amplitude. So you can see the resultant wave has a higher amplitude than the initial waves. And this will occur when the total path difference between two X-rays, that is 2D sine theta, is equal to n lambda where n is the order of reflection. And this particular situation where the two waves, they combine to have a resultant X-rays which have a higher amplitude is called constructive interference and this law is known as Bragg's law. So here you can see that there are uh, uh, planes of atoms present and there are two X-ray beams which are striking different atoms and they are diffracting in different uh, directions and the effective part difference between two X-rays is 2D sine theta. So if this 2D sine theta is equal to N lambda, then we say that it is a constructive interference and we will get the resultant wave which has a higher amplitude than the initial waves. And this is what we call as Bragg's law. Then for destructive interference, when the two X-rays are out of phase, means their crest and troughs, that is, this is the crest and this is the troughs, if they do not occur at the same time, then what will happen? The amplitude of resultant wave will be less than the incident wave. And the total path difference, that is, the path cover, covered by this uh, X-ray and the path covered by this X-ray, the total path difference between two X-rays, 2D sine theta, is not equal to N lambda. And if this is a scenario, then we say that destructive interference will occur as per the Bragg's law. 
So this is the importance of constructive interference and destructive interference. And we use this constructive interference and destructive interference in our XRD setup. So the XRD setup, they have an X-ray source and here the X-rays uh, are generated and they fall on the sample. And we have a detector which moves in a particular angle. So we will come to know that uh, when the X-rays are forming constructive interference or when the X-rays are having destructive interference. And based on that, we can derive a lot of information or we can obtain a lot of information based on these two things. So we can, we can get particle size, we can get particle shape, uh, crystal structure, element or phase identification and quantification. We can get uh, crystallized size, lattice parameter. We can also observe X-ray tomography and we can also do residual stress measurement using this principle. And that is why XRD is usually used to study different materials. This was my work when uh, I was working with uh, electro deposited nickel iron alloy. So this is the first uh, sample which I had. It was pure nickel, nickel 0 weight percent iron. And when I did X-ray diffraction in this particular electro deposited nano crystalline nickel iron sample, I observed that uh, the grains were mostly oriented in 2001 plane and there were some grains oriented in 111 plane also but the rest of the plane the atoms were not aligned to that much extent whereas when i incorporated 18 percent iron into it the composition of my electro deposited sample was nickel 18.5 weight percent iron i could see that the orientation of grains has now changed to 111 in, instead of having 200. So this change in orientation you can observe using X-ray diffraction. Here also, if I annealed this nickel 0 weight percent iron or pure electro deposited nickel, I observed that there was a phase change or there was a change in the orientation of grain in this sample also. Also, with the help of a equation called integral breadth method which is given over here i can calculate grain size and micro strain and i can figure out that how the grain size is changing with the addition of iron and how the micro strain is changing with the addition of iron so i could study my nano crystalline electro deposited nickel iron alloys using uh, xrd also I could comment on the lattice parameter that if I'm increasing the iron content, how my lattice parameter is increasing or how my lattice parameter is changing with addition of iron. So these were my results, these were my XRD results and analysis, but there are a huge lot of things which uh, you can uh, work on and you can analyze using XRD. Now let's talk about the XRD manufacturers. So there are many manufacturers of uh, XRD or many uh, companies which are making XRD equipment. But in this video, I'm only talking about the four which uh, I have come across with. One is Brooker Corporation, one is Ricaco Corporation, one is Thermo Fisher Scientific, and the last one is Melbourne Panalytical. The Brooker Corporation, they have diffractometers. They have D8 Discover, D8 Advanced, D2 Phase Over, and D8 Endeavor diffractometers. And these are used to study crystallographic structure, material properties, phase analysis of different crystalline and amorphous powders, bulk materials, and thin films. They also have single crystal X ray diffraction equipment like D8 Venture, D8 Quest, D8 Quest Eco, and Scout, which are used to study or determine the structure of chemical compounds and biological molecules. Then the Rigaco Corporation, the diffractometers they have are SmartLab, SmartLab SE, Miniflex, and Ultima IV. SmartLab has a function of uh, it can analyze powder diffraction patterns, it can give us the thin film metrology, assay access, in-plane scattering, and 
upper end measurement. The smart lab SE, it will give us the powder diffraction, thin film diffraction, excess, pole figure, residual stress, and non ambient experiments can be carried out in the smart lab SE. In the miniflex, it is used for qualitative and quantitative field analysis of polycrystalline materials. And Ultima IV, it is used for powder diffraction, thin film diffraction, assay excess, pole figure, residual stress, and in plane experiment. The third manufacturer is Thermo Fisher Scientific. The diffractometer they have is ARL Equinox 100 X ray diffractometer. ARL Equinox 1000 X ray diffractometer, ARL Equinox 3000 X ray diffractometer, and ARL Equinox Lau X ray diffractometer. And we can use these diffractometers for phase identification and quantification, degree of crystallinity, cell parameters to study crystallite size, to study lattice strain, crystal structure, residual stress, retool analysis transition phase and thin film analysis. Fourth, we have Malvern Analytical. It, uh, there are four different range of diffractometers that they have. One is ARIS, where they have research addition, cement addition, minerals addition, and metals addition. The second one is Amphidian range, where they have Amphidian and Amphidian Alpha 1. Then they have Expert MRD and Expert MRD X. These diffractometers can be used for phase identification and quantification, thin film metrology, residual stress measurement, epitaxy and texture analysis, mineralogical composition of cement and its intermediate, ore analysis, analysis of sinter, direct reduced iron and retained austenite, to study the structure with peak symmetry and ultra low background. So these are four major manufacturers of XRD which I have come across. With. Now, often we, we confuse ourselves that which equipment I should purchase for my research or which equipment is best for my research. So I would like to give my idea or my approach towards selecting a particular equipment. So my approach is that I first view the top 30, 40 research papers published in the last two to three years in a reputed journal in my area of research. And then I analyze and make a list of what equipment they have used for the research. From the above list, I select two to four equipment that will be best for my research. And then I compare their price, warranty and other services associated with the product. And then I select the one with best price, low maintenance and service cost, and which can serve the research purpose for the longest duration. So this is my approach towards selecting a particular equipment for my research. I hope you like my video and to watch more videos and support my work, please press the bell icon to stay up to date with the channel and subscribe to see the videos as soon as they are uploaded. And if you have suggestions, queries on the content or for possible openings and collaborations, you can reach out to me on my LinkedIn page, via email or by commenting in the YouTube video. And if you have any general queries pertaining to metallurgy and metallurgy and material science, then askmetallurgy.com is a great website. Here is a metallurgy students community having 15 sections like physical metallurgy and heat treatment, mechanical metallurgy and so on and the questioners can select the section most relevant to their question and post that question on the system. That is it from my side. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.